Adonai, so fat I tifta, who fear Gita Hilatecha. Eternal God, open my lips and my mouth shall declare your praises. Shabbat Shalom. Okay. So our text this week will start uh, in Shemot or Exodus 35, verse 30. So let's go there. Good. Says Exodus 35:30 says Moshe said to the people of Israel, "See, behold, Hine, right? Adonai has singled out Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Yehuda. He has filled him with the Spirit of God, with wisdom, understanding, and knowledge concerning every kind of artisanry." He is a master of design in gold, silver, and bronze, cutting precious stones to be set, wood carving, and every other craft. Right? That's what it says. What do we note in these few verses? What do they teach us about Elohim? Is the Ruach Elohim, Jason noted, is the Ruach Elohim only given for teaching or preaching? Or canting, or leading worship services? Hmm? Come on, this is interactive today. <laughs> no, right, all kinds of things. This is artisanry type stuff. Woodwork, everything, right? Tapestries, right? Molding things, metalwork, everything. And he's involved in all of these things. All wisdom. All wisdom, understanding, and knowledge come from the architect and creator of the universe. Also, who gives people their skills and abilities? We get that from this text, right? Who gives people their skills and abilities? You might feel driven to study a particular field, right? You desire, you're like, I really love architecture or, or something, right? I love to cook. I want to be a chef one day. Who gives you that passion? Not just your skill, but your passion. Right? And with hard work, you can do well there. But don't forget who gave you the drive. Who gave you the ability to study and to understand what you're studying. There's a difference, right? <laughs> To understand what you're studying and the wisdom to follow what you learn to make use of it in a good way there's a difference between those three things data and understanding the data and making good use of the data really having wisdom not everyone can understand everything we live in a world of specialists I can't do brain surgery okay but neither can that doctor perform exegesis Unless Yah allows us to cross train, right? <laughs> Thoughts? Who, let me ask you a question. Who was Batsalel's grandfather? Who was Batsalel's grandfather? It's in the text we just read. That's a hint. So do some hunting. Who was Batsalel's grandfather? Hur. Yeah. Who remembers Hur? I know you always hear her. Hur. <laughs> Who remembers Hur? Okay, so what do you remember Hur from? Who is that guy? Uh, uh, Haron on one side, Hur on the other side. They're holding the arms up. Sound familiar? Right? And who are they fighting? Come on, we just went through Purim. Who are they fighting? The Amalekim, the Amalekites, right. The same Amalekites like Agag and Haman, <laughs> came from, right? Yeah. That's where they were fighting. So whatever happened to this guy, Hur, right? Anybody know? Anybody? We ever heard of Hur after, Hur after that? Mm -mm, right? Well, tradition says that Hur was murdered when he tried to stop the people from making the golden calf. Do you remember when Moshe went up, you hear one little bit, when Moshe was going up the mountain, 
right? And, he, and he's worried about the people. The, you know, the response is that Aharon and Hur are there. They'll watch over the people. But when he comes back down the mountain, who's there? Aharon is there, and he's gotten a lot of trouble. And where's Hur? So tradition says he was murdered. Yeah. We don't know. Can't prove that. But it's good to know, right? Now his grandson, he was murdered, remember, about making a golden calf, a false god to worship, right? Now his grandson, who had to live with that, who had to live with that, his grandson is now the chief architect for making the sanctuary of Yah. Is that pretty cool? God is honoring the grandson of the man who, who didn't yield to the crowd. Right? Let's go on. Verse 34. Adonai has also given him and Oholiav, the son of Achim, Achimasach, Achisameh, excuse me, Achisameh, there you go, of the tribe of Don, the ability to teach others. The ability to teach others. So they have all these skills, right? And all kinds of crafts. But if he doesn't give them the, the ability to teach, it's just going to be lost. Right? Like, like good exegesis, I can, I can tell you lessons. But if I don't teach you how to read the languages yourself, if I don't teach you how to do exegesis, how to look for, you know, what, where's a good source for history and to understand culture, right? If something happens to me, then what? If you don't know how to carry on, right? Then it's lost. The ability to teach is important, right? So he gives them the ability to teach others. Also because even in the immediate context, this is a big job. Two guys are not going to be able to do this. So they need help right then. Right. So he's got to be able to teach others. He has filled them, it goes on. He has filled them, yeah, with the skill needed for every kind of work. Whether done by an artisan, a designer, an embroiderer using blue, purple, or scarlet yarn, and fine linen, or a weaver. They have the skill of every kind of work and design. It doesn't say they have the knowledge understanding or wisdom it says he gave them the skill it's one thing to be to have the nerves right to hold steady and be able to do an operation on a brain it's another thing to have the knowledge to know how to do it does this make sense so they had to teach these other guys God gave them the skill but he gave these two the knowledge to pass to them make sense Okay, first on, on this part, I want to tell you the Talmud. You know the Talmud. Who knows about what the Talmud? Okay. <laughs> tell us, what's the Talmud? Rabbinical commentaries. Commentaries on commentaries. Some good stuff, some bad stuff. Okay, so we have the Torah. And then after what, we have the oral Torah rise, which is people making additional laws and commentary. And then we have commentary on the oral law, and the, which is the Talmud, which goes outside. The, like if you see the Talmud, you open it up, the Torah is in the middle, and all these commentaries are on the outside. The right? The Mishnah, the oral Torah. And then commentary on it is included in the Talmud, along with Gemara as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a lot of commentary stuff, right? Traditional rabbinic writings. We don't hold to them, right, as if they were the word of God, but there is some wisdom there. Sometimes it's not all, it's not all good, right? But there is a lot of good there too as well. We've read a lot of the stories, right? In your devotional you see some. The rabbi and the rooster story, if you don't know, ask me later, right? The rabbi and the rooster story, great stuff. Would you agree? Okay. So the Talmud says that Moshe was not just informing the public of these appointments, you know, putting these people in place to lead. Rather, he was consulting the people. It says that the word see, you know, like S-E-E, in this case meant, do you agree? You with me? But look at the text and consider the context and tell me if that makes sense to you. No, go ahead. 
<laughs> Don't look at me. Go ahead. Look at the text. Tell me if it makes sense to you. Does it look like, does it seem like the reason Moshe is putting these two people up there and saying, see, does it seem like it's because he wants the approval of the people? <laughs> okay, so we're in, in Shemot, Exodus, chapter 35. And so a big hint might be to look at back a little bit though at Shavuot 31, 1 to 7, because this is a big passage, right? Or 35, is it 35, 1 to 7 maybe? I'm thinking of, can you check for me? 35, 1 to 7, was it talking about, uh, what's it say there? One of those two places. I can't hear you. Mm -hmm. Oh, you want to hear Okay. He has filled him with the Spirit of God, with wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. Who has filled who? Hashem. Filled. He has filled him. It was Bezalel. He has filled him. So he filled the son of uh, Hur. Mm -hmm. Bezalel. Well, grandson, right? And keep going. Bezalel. And he is a master of design of gold, silver, and bronze, cutting precious stones to be set with carving in every other craft. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Adonai has also given him an old Eliab, the son of Ahitama, of the tribe of Dan, the ability to teach others. He has filled them with the skill needed for every kind of work, whether done by an artisan, a designer, an embroiderer, using wood, purple, and scarlet yarn, and fine linen, or a weaver. So who who's making the choice here? It, is Moshe choosing these guys and then putting them in front of the other people? I don't know. So what what are the what kind of vote do the people get here? I mean, if <laughs> if he puts them up and he's saying, "See, do you approve? Do you want these guys to lead? You help make." The, what if they say no? Is that <laughs> does it even feasible? Does that make any sense? It doesn't sound like there was an option. Yeah. It's done. God, he did it. Yah did it. He said, here's the guys. He didn't say, can I fill you with this skill? There's no right. Yeah. Some people are, ch people are chosen for specific tasks. Does this make sense? Is this true in the Brit Chadashah? Are certain people chosen for certain tasks? Are certain people gifted for certain things? Yeah. Does that mean one is better than the other? No. How do, how, what is the relationship supposed to be like? Like a body. Like a body. We all what? Or a building sometimes too, right? Yeah, we can't make anything without hands. We can't go anywhere without feet. We can't reach people without feet, right? We don't have the right message without the brain, <laughs> right? We don't have the passion for it without the heart. We won't hear it. We don't have the mouth to speak it. Exactly. Exactly. Or a, or, a, or a building, sometimes we're described as a building, right? What if there's a, you know, so a building, you've got to have the foundation. You need, you know, or the whole thing falls apart, right? And, and the building also, we know that we've got to fit together right, because if we don't fit together right, it'll fall apart, right? And who puts us together in the way that we're put together, whether it's a body or a building? Do we choose? Do we choose? Do we say, Father, make me the thumbnail. <laughs> well, so if I want, I can just go. <laughs> All right? <laughs> that way I don't have to feel too connected. You know, just use your clippers and put me somewhere else or something. Or, you know, I mean, maybe he will, right? But, um, you know, it's him. He gives gifts to who he chooses. And he places people where he chooses. Does that make sense? 
Am I speaking the truth? Amen. Okay. All right. And he did this with these two guys. He gave them a special task for a special time. And one of them is being honored because of his grandfather. Next. What do we learn? What else do we learn here? Uh, you know, they could rebel. They could say, no, nah, we don't want to. <laughs> You know, I mean, I don't know if it would make a lot of sense in this case, but you can be called for something even today, right? And you can say, no, I don't want to. That sounds too hard. Yona tried that, right? You know Yona? Yeah. It didn't work out too well for Yona, though, right? No, it didn't work out too well. Okay, so what else do we learn here? One man alone could not direct the whole project. He needed help. Who gave him that help? Who gave him that help? There was a lot of work to do, right? This is a big undertaking. In the building of this community. That's what they're doing. They're building the, the whole thing. This, you know, building the Mishkan, the tent, the tent, is part of building the community. Part of an even bigger task. Right? And this would be the place where they go to meet with Elohim. To go the way they place they go to meet with Yah. That's pretty important, right? Let me ask you, did Moshe have the skills to make the elaborate tent? Did Moshe have the skills? Wait a minute, but well, he's the big guy. I thought he could do everything. And he's the leader. Shouldn't he be, you know, in charge of that too, though? Shouldn't he be just running everything? What do you mean, no? <laughs> right? Why didn't Yah give Moshe the wisdom, understanding, and knowledge to do all of these tasks? He had a lot to do already, right? Yeah. Wouldn't be feasible. He knows. He understands. Everyone, look, people strive their whole lives sometimes and never figure out what they're supposed to be doing with their life. Right? Every, let me assure you, everyone has a purpose. You should be seeking out that purpose and, uh, and trying to figure out. And once you find it, do it. Don't just know what it is. <laughs> do it. Be about it. Right? It's like emunah, like our faith. It's not enough to have mental consent or mental assent and know the information about how we're supposed to live and walk and what we believe in and who we believe in. We're supposed to do it. We're supposed to carry it out with action, right? Taste and see that Adonai is good, right? I can put a plate, I don't know if you like brownies, I can make a, make a thing of brownies and put it in front of you. It could smell good. You could smell it from way over there. I could like fan, put a fan here. You know, smell of brownies, fill the room. And I could tell you, taste and see that these brownies are good. And you could say, man, those brownies do smell good. I'll bet they really they look good too. I know those brownies are good. You don't really know those brownies are good. Unless you taste those brownies. Right? Do you understand? Come seek the Lord. Come seek the Lord. Drink and eat freely. Right? In the building of a community, everyone has a, a part to play. Whether they choose to do their part is in their own hands. To some degree, right? God might chase them down, right? Like Yoda, and beat them a little bit to make, try to make them do it. But it's still in their hands. But everyone has the opportunity to give to the building program, right? Building the community in one way or another. Think about some of the poor people who gladly gave to the project. You know, there were rich people, there were leaders, but there were poor people too. And yet everyone gave to the project to build this community. You ever think about that? Why do you suppose they did it? Why would you do it? If you were there, would you do it? And why would you do it? If you were poor. Yeah, yeah, it's a trust issue. Yeah. It's like grateful attitude. After gr gratefulness after going through the Reed Sea. I'm saying so they can hear. I'm tired of carrying all this gold. 
<laughs> Jason is just too rich, he says. <laughs> it's too heavy to carry all the gold. <laughs> There might have been one guy. <laughs> there might have been one guy. <laughs> Sorry. I said that they brought so much. They had so much gratitude for being saved that they yeah. brought so much that at one point, right, they had to say, "Fellow people, don't bring anymore because we have no." Need yeah, we're not there yet, but yeah, yeah, yep, you're right. And also, let me say that the spirit of the shed up in the hearts of people or whoever. Yeah, yeah, we're not there yet, but yeah, <laughs> no, it's good. It's okay. Yeah, no, no, it's that's good. It's good you read the portion. So you're right. Th yeah, but that's part of answering the question. So you're absolutely right. Allah stirred the hearts of people to give. It's actually my next words here that I wrote. El stirs the hearts. All right. Think about this. How many of them, once this thing was built? would say to their children or their children's children with joy in their hearts you know we gave some of that fabric for that tent see that part right over there right we gave some of that goat hair i know you can't see it i'm um, trust me there's goat hair in between <laughs> and that came from us right you know, your grandfather, your grandmother gave her wedding ring. Your grandmother gave her wedding ring so that we could make the ark. Whenever, if you ever see the ark, you can't really see the ark. You just see the pole sticking out, <laughs> right? When you see that thing and they're carrying it by, your grandmother gave her wedding ring so we could make that ark. Scripture calls it a teruma an elevation offering here's a question who or what is being elevated give me your thoughts what a truma is an elevation offering that's what they're giving who or what's really being elevated what do you think When you elevate, yeah. Uh, how do you, how do you feel when you're in worship? Like there's a really a really a song that you love, and you're like worshiping. You get really deep into the worship. How do you feel? How do you feel? Huh? You kind of feel elevated, right? When you get, when, I don't know if you ever, if you give something really big or special sometimes, to some cause, I know you must have this feeling. I know you must. I'm pointing at Tiffany. She runs the downtown, the ministry that goes downtown, right? And helps the poor all the time. How do you feel when you're helping those people? How does it make you feel? I guess, um, I would say like on a cloud, so maybe that is all it is, yeah? Maybe you feel it's, it's, you're serving it's, Yah when you do that. You know, you're serving God. You're sh serving Yeshua. It's a very You know, I, I don't know that we fully understand or realize sometimes when we're giving to, so, to some things what it is that we're doing. Or maybe we have more of that feeling. Do you know what I mean? What are we trying to do here? And how are we doing it? And when we do do it, like with Barbara, we had an Orthodox lady join us, right? She didn't know what she was going into. <laughs> she came and joined us. Right? And then when the first few weeks she could, Rabbi, you're not doing it right. You know what I mean? Because she's very stuck in the Orthodox traditional ways. After about a year, you know, she moved back to New, to New York, where she used to live, New Jersey, I'm sorry. And what does she say now? She told all those people up there. They're not doing it right. 
<laughs> You're not doing it right. And she called Jason, right? And Jason was a good friend of hers. And she said, Jason, they're not doing it. You guys are doing it right. You know what I'm saying? How did that make you feel when you heard this? And she's praying in Yeshua's name now. She's doing it in the midst of, a, she had, she's living in an Orthodox community. <laughs> and it keeps slipping out. It's a very dangerous situation in some respect. We had to pray for Barbara if you'd write that down for later. But how does it make you feel when she calls and tells you that? Yeah, but how do you feel? feel good do you feel bad does it put you make you feel when we when we when we feel bad sometimes we say what we feel down but when we feel good we feel lifted up right sometimes more than others but do you agree i don't want you to say it if you don't it's okay right a truma an elevated uh, elevation offering so when you contribute money to a ministry, you're not just fulfilling a duty, you're giving to something bigger, something bigger than the sub. Do you know what I mean? God's able to multiply. I think that's what she prayed, right? Isn't that what Lord has prayed? Multiply this. Put it to good use, God, and multiply it. And, and do, he's able to multiply your giving and do incredible things. And then you can say to your family, Someday, your children and your grandchildren, you know, we had a part in that. Right? I hope you can say that, you know, with joy. Right? Look what we did. It's not what. You know, this, from the day one, this is us. What we do, right? This is our study. We want it to be sincere, and we want to be, right? And we want to be real. We want to answer the tough questions. We don't want to avoid anything, and we want to worship Yah. Isn't that what we said? And that's what we're doing now, oh, right? You feel like that's what we're doing? I hope so. If you don't, talk to me later. Right? Okay. Uh, keep your hand on this page, but... Look quickly with me at, at Mark 13, 34. This was part of what we were reading this week. And I don't know if you noticed this when you read it this week, but in the context of the passage, for those who are not on our reading plan, is the end of the age. Is that yeah, 1334. And Yeshua says here that this is the part I want to key on, right? It's like a man who travels away from home, puts his servants in charge, each with his own task, and tells the, door the doorkeeper to stay alert. You, you see this? You see this section? It's like a man who travels away from home, puts his servants in charge, each with his own task. So let me ask you in this parable, who's the man who leaves home? Yeshua, right? Everyone agree? Who are his servants? We have one say believers. Does everyone agree? Any other answers? Disciples? Believers? That's good. Shepherds. Shepherds. <laughs> Some were shepherds, right? Okay. You say like it's only uh, shepherds. When you say shepherds, you mean like only the leaders or something? Hmm. So some people wouldn't have this responsibility. Only. Okay, we'll leave it hanging. Possibility, right? But is it a possibility? Are are you? A, is it? Is there anyone in here that doesn't feel like they're a leader? If you don't feel like a leader, let me ask you a question. Are you a servant of Yah? Yeah? Okay. Because because like we've read in other texts, and this one is included in this, it's a it's scripture is the same throughout, the same message. Everyone has a task. If everyone has a task, everyone's a servant. And when he leaves, so now who are his servants? 
It's all of those who truly believe in him and follow him. Right? What does it say about them in this verse? They each have a task. Maybe some are to preach. What kind of task? Are some are to teach. Maybe some are to build houses. Maybe some are to clean those houses. Maybe some are to finance houses. Maybe some are to import food or export food or feed the hungry. All of these tasks and many more are interrelated. You can't feed the poor unless there are farmers out there and truckers and grocers. And they all have families to care for as well. Everyone plays a part. A doctor can't treat you properly without first undergoing years of intensive studies. Someone could pretend to be a doctor and they could treat you one way or another. Would you trust that, a person like that? Would you trust a self-trained, self-proclaimed doctor with your daughter or your mother or your life? Your own life? doubt it. Yeah, you can, it can be funny when we're talking with each other, but would you really do that? I don't think so. Right? I don't think so. Likewise, a spiritual leader can't teach you properly without being properly prepared. And guess what? The doctor is no less chosen than the farmer or the housewife or the rabbi. We're interrelated, all of us, and we just have different tasks. And anything Kahila and Elohim does, we all do. As David said, when some of his people didn't want to share the spoils of war, also in our passage, right? He knew that it was Adonai who had given them the goods. Adonai, who had protected them and handed the... Who was it? Who was the raiding party? Again, the Amalekites. Who handed the, over the Amalekite raiding party to them. So he said what? He said, the share of someone, of someone, those who stay with the equipment, will be the same as the share of someone who goes out and fights. People who say otherwise, he said, are evil. The scripture says they're evil. I know, right? I was reading out like, man, I, wait a minute. If I go out and fight, there are bullets going past my head. I'm thinking I deserve a little more than that guy back at the supply department. <laughs> right? And our government agrees with that. They say, combat pay. But what does the Torah say? What does the Tanakh say? What did King David say? same. They get the same. Now go back to our Exodus text, starting with verse 36. I hope you kept your hand there. But Salel and Aholiab, along with all the craftsmen whom Adonai has endowed with the wisdom and skill necessary to carry out the work needed for the sanctuary, are to do exactly according to everything Adonai has ordered. You see a parallel here for those who follow Mashiach, for those who follow Yah, God, are we to live however we please? No. Shaul, Paul would say, God forbid. <laughs> right? Very popular thing for him to say. <laughs> Yah forbid. Also, though, it was only Batalel and Aholiab who Adonai, Hashem, endowed with wisdom and skill in this passage. No, no, it wasn't really, was it? We just read a little bit different. Did he endow them with wisdom immediately, or did they get this wisdom once they were taught? And even when you're taught by someone, who's really giving you that wisdom? Yeah. Still Hashem. Does that make sense? A teacher can give you the data. A teacher can try to help you make sense of it. But the one who allows you to make sense of it, the one who allows you to use it to really grasp it, is Hashem.
Okay, now we're, the, we're into, I'm sorry, I said verse 36. Chapter 36, that was verse, now we're in verse 2. Moshe, and we're almost there. Moshe summoned Bezalel, Aholiab, and every craftsman to whom Adonai had given wisdom. Everyone whose heart stirred him to come and take part in the work. Again we see what? Why did they come? Why did people give before? Why are they coming to do work now? Adonai is stirring their heart. You'll know it. You should, you know, if you're if you're living right, if you're in tune with Yah, you'll know what you're supposed to be doing. Your heart will be stirred to do what you're supposed to be doing. Doesn't that make it easy? That makes it easier. If you feel, look, we don't live strictly by passion. We don't live strictly by feeling. Feelings can lead you astray. Right? You understand? That's like living by the flesh. Letting your feelings guide you. Living by the Spirit. The Spirit inspired the Word. The Spirit gives the message. He tells us directly what's right, what's wrong. We live by the Spirit, not by the flesh. We don't follow our feelings. It's great when we have good feelings, right? But just because we feel bad one day, do we give up our faith? No. No. Right? Good answer. <laughs> okay, so uh, did they just start working on their own? No. No, they were summoned by the spiritual leader. Right? Moshe summoned them, it says in verse 2. Do you suppose everyone has, uh, everyone uh, who was summoned, this is a different kind of question though, right? Did everyone who was summoned come? Now he summoned every craftsman, right, whose heart stirred him. That doesn't mean they all came. Do you sometimes feel a prompting to do something and you don't do it? Don't answer me. <laughs> right? That's, that's why I was walking down. I was just taking my walk the other morning. And uh, I couldn't, you know, I didn't want to. I'm like, this is crazy. I'm like, no, I'm going to keep going. No. I felt the prompting to stop and talk with this guy I just saw on the side of the road for no reason. <laughs> right? And, uh, and I knew who it was. <laughs> Not the guy. But I wanted to keep going. No, I'm on my walk, man. I, it's tough enough to get motivated to go exercise, right? <laughs> And I took a few steps and I oh, all right. Because I know, you know, I've heard, you know, the, the longer you fight against it, the harder it becomes. And the task can be harder too. Things will happen to make it more difficult. And you're still going to wind up doing it. Ask Yoda, right? And you're still going to wind up doing it. So I turned around and I went and talked to the guy. And he might be joining us in a couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I knew the guy from nothing. And we're talking about theology for 15 minutes while he's supposed to be. I, I was a little nervous for him because he's supposed to be on the job. I'm like looking for his foreman, you know what I mean? But we're talking about theological issues and sincerity and integrity and things like that um, and different religions and, and things that he's come across. And he was very intrigued and he, he might show up here because I followed the prompting. If he shows up here, you know, part of it is, you know, it's all about God, but God told me to do that. And I'm, oh, John, look what you did. You brought a guy. No. You know what I mean? And when he comes, does he stay? And that's part uh, part of how God might use you. What will he see when he comes? What, what do people see when they come? What kind of people are we? Are we, you know, are we sincere? Are we, do we reflect, you know, Yah and Torah? Do we reflect Yeshua? Do we, you know, are we coming and we like trying to get a check in the box and go on our way? Or are we really in worship, right? Okay. So the ones whose heart stirred them were summoned and they came. Did this just go off? I think it died.
secondly, in the, from this little group, imagine the joy of being able to, to help build the dwelling place of the eternal God. I want to throw something out there. Yeshua said, whenever you've done something for the least of my brothers, you've done it for me. Can you make a connection there? Can you make a connection there? You know what I mean? We can argue about who his brothers are, if you like. I'm going to say it anyway. When you, when you help Habitat for Humanity or any other organization like Build Homes for the Poor or the Homeless, you are helping to build a home for the eternal God. Do you, do you hear me? Do you understand what I'm saying? Thoughts? Do you agree? Do you disagree? You don't want to disagree now, right? You'll disagree with me later, maybe. <laughs> okay. Do you see my the viewpoint I'm trying to get across, though? Whenever you do something for the least of my brothers, you do something for me. We're, all, you know, there's a sense that Israel is a family, but all of humanity is also a family. We all come from one couple, and we all came from Him. Now let's go back to the text and wrap it up. Verse three. They received from Moshe all the offering which the people of Israel had brought for the work of building the sanctuary. But they still kept bringing voluntary offerings every morning until the craftsmen doing the work for the sanctuary left the work they were involved with to tell Moshe, quote, the people are bringing far more than is needed to do the work Adonai has, has ordered done. So Moshe gave an order which was proclaimed throughout the camp Neither men nor women are to make any further efforts for the sanctuary offering. <laughs> Please note the generosity of the people. <laughs> note the honesty of the craftsmen. Think about that. Note the humility of Moshe. None of them are looking to profit personally from this undertaking. Israelites are always getting a bad rap and, and, and many, not all, many churches and seminaries around the world and, and, and people groups as well outside of congregations, right? Well, how are we doing here? Where's the heart of the people now in this text? Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also, someone said. Right? Where's the stereotypical stingy Jew now? More importantly, what about you? What about you, listener? Right? Oh, yes, they're over there. I forgot. <laughs> Who then? What about you? When there's a project to be done for God's kingdom, where's your heart? Where's your heart? Back to the text, the ending of what I want to talk about. In this way, the people were restrained from making additional contributions. For what they had already was not only sufficient for doing the work, but too much. And every rabbi pastor around the world said, what a great problem to have. Imagine too much treasure being collected. One more question before we begin. Is this passage talking about tithes? These are offerings. These are above and beyond. Tithes are required. But there are a lot of people who don't even want to, want to tithe. But well, all of this giving was above and beyond. And it was not only more than was needed, more, not only more than was needed, but too much. There are two of, <laughs> These are offerings for a special project. And the Humash says... That in, in 3522, verse 3522, there's a tribute to the women of Israel where the text says, Im Hanashim, with the women, right? Why? Most of the jewelry would belong to who? <laughs> right? To whom? Excuse me. To whom? The women. 
and they're said to have immediately removed it and rushed forward to give. Isn't that cool? In fact, the, the text, uh, the Humash also notes two types of givers in the text. Two types of givers, okay? I know what you might be thinking. Wait, wait, hold on. One, those whose spirit motivated them to give what they could afford voluntarily and wholeheartedly. Those are the good ones, right? Two, an even nobler category whose heart inspired them to do more than they could afford. So great was their desire to share in the building of the tabernacle. Whoa. But, did anyone notice when you read this that the leaders were the last ones to give an offering? <laughs> How do you feel about that? Hmm? I almost don't want to be a leader. <laughs> what? Does it say anything to you? On the top of your head? What's the first thing that comes... You know, if you notice, hey, the leaders are the last ones. Why is that, I wonder? What comes to your mind, do you think? It's okay, be honest. The first should be last. I'm pretty sure didn't they take theirs from the offering that they pay? Well, you're thinking of tithing, where people give to the Levites, and then Levites give to the Kohanim, and then Levites. Yeah, that's a different. That's tithing. That's tithing. Oh, did you hear that? Can you say that louder? Maybe they were waiting to see what was still needed. You know what? Some some will defend them. The Humash says that very thing. Some defend them, saying they're waiting to make sure that the offering would be enough. You know, if they gave last, then they they could uh, they could make sure that everything that comes in that it would be enough to make sure the job got done. Does that make sense? That's a pretty good you know. And there are people who would, who would do that, right? Another view, and this is of interest to my Hebrew students out there, notes that there is an interesting anomaly in Exodus thirty-five twenty-seven. The word for leaders. And that verse is spelled defectively. It should have two yods, but it has none. And some say this defectiveness is a rebuke that reflects a defectiveness in the hearts of those leaders. That's uh, Rabbi Nassam in Bamidba Rabbi 12:16 in the. Some say they were shamed. And the next time an offering would be taken up, they would be the first to give when the Mishkan is dedicated in Numbers chapter 7. Remember Numbers? I don't know if you, how much you've read the Bible, if you've read it a few times or whatever. Right? With the dedication of the tabernacle, what happens? All the leaders give first with the big wagons and, you remember? Yeah. They give last year, suddenly they're giving first. Interesting. And verse eight: All the skilled men among them who did the work made uh, did the work made the tabernacle using ten sheets of finely woven linen and blue, purple, and scarlet yarn. He made them with kuruvim worked in that had been crafted by a skilled artisan. And this is the this is the last that's the last uh, verse I believe I'm going to read. Yeah, last verse I'm going to read. We're almost there. So, first question about this is, what are karuvim? Does your, do you have a version that says something different? And if you don't, what is karuvim? Cherub, cherub, Yeah, English people, you say, hear cherubim all the time, right? Angels. These are the elite angels. These are the, the ar people call archangels sometimes, right? They always stand in the presence of God. When you see the, uh, when, God Aden, right? Garden of Eden, and God closes off the garden, and you see a two angel like guarding with the with the right, and then you see the ark being built, and the ark being built, right, called the mercy seat. It's like the throne of God and the holy of holies. What is on the ark? 
two Karuvim, always in the presence. And what's what's on the tapestry right behind the ark? Karuvim. You follow? Okay. Now, making these images making these images of Karuvim. Is this idolatry? Why? Doesn't, doesn't the commandment against idolatry say don't make any image of anything in the heavens above? Oh, there's... You, you telling me there's a context? Oh. Oh. So even though it says don't make any image of anything in the heavens above, you got to keep reading to get the point, to get the whole understanding. I see. I see. So that means like the photo albums I have at home, those are okay? As long as you don't bow down. As long as I don't bow down to them. Oh, okay. I understand. So I can have pictures on my wall too, right? What about, what if I, I don't know, I had an urge to go to Greece and get the old statue of Zeus, you know, and call it St. Peter and start kissing its top. Would that be okay? Would that be idolatry? Do you think? The kiss of the toe. Kind of wrong. That's a little too far. Okay, let me think. Take a quick poll, right? So, photo album is okay. Raise a hand. Yeah. Photo album not okay. People, <laughs> well, there's only like three people think photo album is okay. Okay, I'm in a tough crowd. All right, and uh, as long as you're not we might have some debate later. Or kissing the photo album. As long as you're not bowing down, worshiping, and kissing the. Okay, yeah. Let's add the context, right? Is the photo album on my shelf at home okay? As long as we're not worshiping the pictures or the things in the pictures and bowing down to that. Now raise your hands. Are the pictures things that are approved by Hashem? What are, they are they approved by Hashem? Right? <laughs> what kind of pictures are those, John? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the content here, you know. If it's pictures of like some crazy, you know, pagan stuff, then probably I wouldn't want that. I think our lesson of context has, has gone over well. <laughs> I think we're getting the point there. Okay, so it, listen, if, if ed, making any kind of image for any kind of reason was wrong, why did God command them to make these karuvim? Do you understand? When, if it was always wrong, why did God give the context within the Ten Commandments immediately after saying not to make those images, say, not, do not bow down to them? Does this give us insight into why we're not making these set of images? Of course it does. Context matters. Something's so very clear, right? Getting a statue of a pagan god, renaming it, and bowing down and kissing its toe, probably not good. <laughs> right? Um, but having a picture of your family, right? Hmm. Huh. Okay. She said, "What if you have a picture of that God hanging on the wall? Which, which, which God are we talking about? Because you're not supposed to make any image, any image, you know, pictures of Hashem, right? He says it very specifically. No one has seen me, so don't make any pictures of me." You're just making stuff like up, right? Like, uh, like Are you talking about pictures of false, false gods? Like false. Yeah. So okay. then, uh, calling it Christ. Yeah. Oh, well, you guys calling it Christ? Oh, wow. Well, that okay. That adds uh, additional context. I think clearly that's wrong. When it was originally done. Yeah. 
Yeah, the reverse is like our fathers have inherited lies. So listen, the scripture has examples of graven images that God not only uh, doesn't go against, but he actually commands, the Keruvim. What about the, the snake on the stick, right? So you have to look at this bronze snake on a stick in order to be saved, right, in the wilderness from the venom of the snake bites that are going through. But what happens later do you know there's a problem later with that same stick, that same snake on that same stick? Later in the book of Shoftim, Judges, what happens? People start to worship that snake on that same stick. And scripture said, no! God says, no! Right? Now we have a problem. <laughs> right? He commanded making that back then. It wasn't something people were to worship. They're just supposed to look at it as an act of faith. You see the difference? Okay. I hope you see the difference. All right. And I'm not going to go through the rest of these sheets. As we draw near to Passover, Passover, let's start looking for the leaven in our lives. Let's start looking for the sin so we can get it out of our homes and out of our lives. Let's start purifying ourselves so we can be ready to come into the wedding feast as a bride who has made herself ready. Let's be zealous in serving the master. Let's not be the ones whose lamps go out because they didn't have enough oil. Let's not mess around with this. Let's not gamble with our souls. The ones who didn't have enough oil, did they get in? They didn't make it. I don't want any of you to miss out. Let's work together. Let's do it joyfully. Right? This is good this is good work. It's good stuff. It will elevate you. Joyfully to build up his kingdom in our time and during our days. Amen? Master, when we come together as a community, help us to remember to treat each other with love and respect. But more than that, help us to honor you with our words, our thoughts, and our actions. Help us to serve you well in the name above all names. What's that name? Yeshua. What is it? Yeshua, Yeshua Mashiach. Amen.